Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Dan and Joe Sports Show. As always, I'm Dan. And I'm Joe. Well, Joe, uh, I'm still trying to digest uh, the heart attack that Brian Harson had over the weekend. And Joe, this is not just a regular heart attack. This is a Billy Joel-esque heart attack where you can throw the ag 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 in. Because that was the most awful thing I've ever seen on a football field in the history of Auburn football. Watched some bad games before, but they've never blown a 28-3 28 to three lead against anyone, much less against Mississippi State. Sorry to hate on Mississippi State, but there's generally a huge gulf between the two programs of Auburn and Mississippi State. That Auburn's first 28 to three uh, blown lead would not have been against Mississippi State uh, if I were to guess anyone, especially not against uh, Mike Leach's Mississippi State. I would have definitely thought a Dan Mullen led Mississippi State team would have a better chance of doing this. Then again, I wouldn't have given any Mississippi State chance to do a chance to do with it on Saturday. Yeah, I would give very few teams a chance to come back like that at Auburn. It really baffled me because at the beginning of the game, I was out at a, attending a fundraiser luncheon, and then you called me with a score update, and then I had some other stuff I had to do, and I finally got home to check the game, and then I saw where State was kind of chipping away, but I still didn't think it was possible. But then I was just, you know – what I, what I saw in the second half, just blown away by, like, the offensive numbers the state put up. Like, I just cannot believe the ascension of um, of um, what's the state quarterback team. Yeah, Will Rogers. Because here's the thing. I actually watched him two years ago in high school play a playoff game in Mississippi, and I came away from the game not even, like, knowing who he was. Like, that's kind of the impact he had on me. He didn't have a huge impact. And then last year I started hearing like that he's at Mississippi State. And I'm like, wait, I saw this guy in high school. I, like I did not see an SEC caliber quarterback. But my goodness, I mean, um, Mike Leach has just allowed him to take off. And, and you look at those stats, what, over 400 yards and six touchdown passes to no interceptions? I mean, that, that's crazy. No, it is. And, I mean, it, it shows you a testament to – the kind of toughness that Leach has put on that team and on Will Rogers' toughness because the beginning of that game, he started off 9 of 17, and you could tell the pass rush was getting to him. He was missing wide open wide receivers, and it looked like the moment was too big for him. Um, Auburn got out to that 28-3 to lead, and their offense looked completely anemic. And, you know, there's in a game like this where that happens, there's so many moments that are pivotal. But uh, outside of the one that we'll talk about later, that's, you know, that's some, a, a rule discussion that you and I'll have. I think the biggest moment in that was Mississippi State got a touchdown to make it 28 to 10. And Auburn had scored on their first four possessions and with very little time left, drove in and had a 55 yard field goal, which, I mean, it sounds like a long field goal, but for Honors Carlson, that's nothing. The dude can kick it 70 yards. And he's been in a huge rut the last few games, Joe. I mean, it's been very strange. Uh, he, you know, I feel like he's got a lot of weight to try and be as good as his brother is. And right now, if you look at his career, he's not even in the same hemisphere as what Daniel Carlson did when he was in Auburn. And I don't know if maybe that's what's gotten to him, but he's been bad these last few games. And he clinks one off the uprights. And it, um, instead of it being 31 to 10, it's 28 to 10 going into the half. And I think if Auburn would have gotten that extra points right there at the end of the first half, gotten a little bit of the momentum there, I think they would have they would have closed the game out and probably won by three plus scores. But they missed that. The Mississippi State gets the ball to begin the second half, gets a touchdown, and then all of a sudden they get back in this game and they score 40 points in a row, which I can't even believe I'm saying that. 40 points in a row against an Auburn defense that, Joe, frankly, I thought was tailor-made to go against this, this kind of offense. I mean, you look at the secondary, Roger McCreary is a top-20 draft pick. Smoke Monday is probably a guy that's a, you know, second, third-round type draft pick. And I thought that this was probably the worst offense that could go against an Auburn defense. And it looked like that for a half. But then they really got it together in the second half and what an impressive performance by Will Rogers and a coaching job by Mike Leach. No, it really was. And, you know, I thought coming into the game, I think we said this in the preview show on Saturday morning, I always feel like, you know, typically the more physical team that runs the football, they win these kind of matchups in the trenches. And I really thought that Auburn was going to be able to kind of assert their will that way. But it's just baffling, unfathomable, you know, what developed, to your point, the 40 unanswered points and seeing more of, you know, a finesse team that throws the football, winning this type of matchup on the road in a hostile environment. Um, but I know that you said that, you know, with an 11 o'clock kickoff, that would be a little bit different as far as uh, 
the atmosphere and everything. Um, as far as Carlson missing the kick, you know, we did, of course, see who was it, the Texas Tech kicker make a 60 yarder, I believe, um, to win the game yeah. for Texas Tech. And so, you know, these college kickers can definitely, you know, make some uh, lengthy kicks. But I agree with you that that was certainly um, a turning point because if you're Auburn, you know, you build this big lead. But then if you allow the other team to kind of chip away and if you miss a field goal like that, that allows them to suddenly have, you know, some belief going into halftime. It's a lot easier to build off of like a two touchdowns and a field goal deficit opposed to three touchdowns. It, it's a big psychological difference. And then Joey missed another one later in the game. And then you cap all this off with not only uh, Carlson tearing his ACL later, but Bo Nix fracturing his ankle. And then both of them are done for the season. I mean, this was the ultimate nightmare game for Auburn. Uh, it was everything that you could possibly go wrong. And it did. And I'm really going to be interested to see how they respond this week with TJ Finley at quarterback. And, and we'll talk about that um, in the next segment. Um, but, Joe, you know, one thing, there's a lot of, you know, like I said, a lot of things that happen in this game that make it what it is. Like I said, you get Carlson, make two more field goals. Suddenly there's only a field goal left for them to have to go for. But they had, the defense finally made a stop. They sacked Will Rogers twice in a row. And the second sack was what I thought was just an absolutely amazing play. T.D. Moultrie, who had been hurt, came back, was having the game of his life, had multiple sacks in this game, jumps up to knock a pass down. You know, when he does it, he's launching himself to try and knock a pass down. Goes towards Will Rogers, and what is an amazing athletic play, even throws his head backwards, and they don't and they don't call targeting on the field. Everything's fine. They review it, and they call targeting. It would have been, I think, fourth and 27. And they were out of field goal range. Auburn would have gotten the ball back, down by eight points. Suddenly, this is this game is, is different. Auburn's got all the momentum. Somehow on the review, I have no idea how they did this because every single announcer is like, there's no way they could find targeting on this. There's no way you could justify targeting on this. Anyone watching the game couldn't do it. And what made it even worse, Joe, is that like five minutes earlier, a Mississippi State player had literally given an Auburn receiver a concussion. He's on a concussion, can't even play anymore. Kobe Hudson was having a great game, got knocked out of the game by a Mississippi State guy. They called targeting on the field and then reversed it. And on this one, when they didn't call it, they called targeting, give Mississippi State the first down. They score, of course, two plays later because that just took the complete wind out of Auburn's sails. And I just – I don't understand what's targeting anymore. I mean, what more can you ask of a player than to jump in the air, try to try to smack down a, a ball, and then as he's going to the quarterback, throw his head back and try not to hit him in the head. I mean, what's he supposed to do? Is he supposed to fracture his own ankle by rolling this way to avoid hitting the quarterback? I mean, what do you want these defensive players to do now? Mm-hmm. Well, it's like I told you in the pre-show when we were planning out our topics tonight, you know, the only consistency – about targeting is that it's become a moving target as far as the definition. I mean, there's just nothing that consistently makes sense about the definition of targeting. And I think that a couple of things I've noticed that's kind of weird is I've watched some games where I feel like the replay is almost like a Photoshopped um, compilation. Like it's like nothing like versus what I saw on the field. I'm like, no, there's no way it was that egregious when I saw yeah. it like in real time. So I've noticed that first and foremost, you know, no conspiracy there, but just something I've noticed. And then the second thing I've noticed to your point is like, it just, it's so frustrating to me how the, the, the inconsistency of the calls that will be reversed versus the calls that like stand. And to me, just not, not, nothing about it adds up. It, it doesn't. I mean, you're going to reverse the one where the guy actually calls the concussion and then uh, reverse it to a targeting on the one where the guy's trying to do what you wanted to do by the rule. I mean, it makes no sense whatsoever. Mm-hmm. Yeah, something's got to be uh, changed with it because, you know, at the end of the day, like I get what they're trying to do. Like I'm all about uh, player safety, but just the way they're going about it just doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. <laughs> you know, and the last thing I'll say about this game too, and I wanted to get your thoughts on this, Joe, how do you feel about coaches – when they're down by 15 points going for two points, the first time they score a touchdown instead of the second, because Harson, uh, we scored a touchdown. Bo Nix after being injured 
comes back on the field, leads a very good drive when he can barely walk, and they get a touchdown. And instead of kicking the extra point there and being down by eight, they go ahead and go for two and don't get it. And then they're down by nine points, and that's why the final margin was 43 to 34. And I just didn't understand that because in my mind, wouldn't you want to be in the game as long as you could be in it? Yes, precisely. Like my my philosophy has always been you go for two at the last possible moment. Like you want to stay in the game. Yeah, you want to keep it like a one possession as long as you can. Yeah, and then they wouldn't have had to go kick an onside kick at that point because there would have been like four and a half minutes left. But instead, now they're down by nine, they had to kick an onside kick, and then the game ended up being over. But, you know, moving forward, uh, there's been so many good things, I think, in Harson's first year, and this takes away a, a lot of them right here. You know, it's uh, – right now he's got four losses. The best he can do is finish with four losses, and that's assuming you beat, you know, South Carolina, Alabama, and whoever you play in the bowl game. And now, I mean – you know, I think that would have if, if he could have, you know, only had the AM loss and then lost to Alabama and finished the season nine and four or something, I think that would have been something Auburn fans would like because what was the nickname you gave Gus, all the Auburn fans? Five lost Gus, right? You yeah. know, so uh you know, Hartson right now is looking like five losses might be the best case scenario, and that's not gonna lead a whole lot of optimism going into the offseason. Yeah, it's one of those things where like it's been an encouraging season for the most part for Auburn, but like it could have been so much better with yeah. a couple of different breaks and a couple of different wins. And I think about like Hugh Freeze's first season, you know, like it was kind of similar in the sense that um, obviously there's a drastic different level of expectation here versus Ole Miss in 2012. But I remember that year that Ole Miss lost like heartbreakers to LSU and Texas A&M that easily could have won. And mm-hmm. so it's just like you easily could have had eight or nine wins. Instead, you were seven and six. But yeah, the, the narrative at Auburn is, you know, there's definitely more pressure to perform. And especially, like you said, with uh, with Gus Malzahn, with his tendencies. Because, I mean, the thing is, you know, Gus barely ever got up 28 to three on anybody, but he never blew a lead that was even in that same hemisphere. He, uh, he blew a... 21 to three lead against Florida state in the national championship. I think it was. Yeah. And that was, you know, and I always blamed him for that one because I thought he coached that game very badly afterwards. And, you know, the biggest like coaching error I thought with Howard Harson was they only had eight rushes in the second half. Auburn did. And I don't understand why when you have a 28 to three lead with a quarterback who's injured, that you only run the ball eight times. That's very, puzzling, very puzzling to me. No, it is, and also you would add in the component that when you're playing these spread pass heavy, pass heavy teams, pass happy teams, you know, limit their possessions. Like the more clock you eat, you know, the less time they're on the field. Right. Well, let's go to a positive note, Joe. Ole Miss played an absolutely fantastic game with the game day, uh, you know, appearance of Lane Kiffin. Uh, they had game day in Oxford for the first time since the Katy Perry game. And the defense showed up like the Land Shark defense did. I mean, that was a game that was all on the defense with the way they won. Ole Miss's offense, it wasn't bad, but you know, it kind of reminded me of a lot of Auburn offenses under Gus, where they got all these yards, drove into the red zone, and couldn't capitalize. And so, really, the, you know, when you when you look at that, I know you are like me. We're not exactly the most optimistic Ole Miss fans. We watch games. Every time they would come out of the red zone with either a field goal or not scoring any points, I started getting more and more worried because you knew that A&M's got some horses. They've got two running backs that can take it the distance. they got Anaya Smith, who's a very solid receiver, and, of course, Watermeyer, who's an excellent tight end. And even though they're deficient at quarterback, you kind of thought we were just letting them hang around so much that it might end up going the other way. But – credit the defense for them being the horses that got us this W and especially at the end in like the course of three plays with a big interception inside the 10 yard line on a 50, 50 ball, great play. And then of course the pick six by Finley, I think it was like two plays later and that completely shut it down. And for, you know, defense that I'm not going to say they get hated on all the time, but they're definitely one of the least respect defenses in the sec. Uh, Dave Dorn did an excellent job 
shutting down what well, wasn't a great A&M offense by any means, but still it's one that's got five stars all around and that's got some very talented players and a great play caller in Jimbo Fisher. And he looked completely out of sorts in that game. He really did. And I'm with you. I was very concerned um, when Ole Miss was coming up with empty possessions on offense in the red zone. I was really scared when it was 15 to 13 before that interception that, um, you know, set up the touchdown by Snoop Connor, I believe. Um, the, you know, the thing about Ole Miss is the offense, you can move the football, but really not only in this game, but I've, I've seen it happen probably far too often this year. There's been a lot of drives that have kind of sputtered or sizzled out. Like, when you look at Matt Corral's statistics, I think, you know, the one thing that is really hurting him in his Heisman candidacy right now is the fact that he only has 17 passing touchdowns. And I know he has a good, you know, touchdown interception ratio of 17 to 2, but you would think he had, would have more than 17. Like, you would think it would be closer to 30 at this point with the talent that he has with his arm. But anyway, be as it may, still, you know, can't take anything away from the defensive performance for Ole Miss. I'm still so excited to see them get that win against Texas A&M. It's kind of that marquee win um, for Lane Kiffin. And now that they defeated A&M, you know, everything's set up where they really have a realistic chance to go to a New Year's Six Bowl. I think they're looking at either probably, depending on the outcome of the SEC championship game, the Fiesta Bowl or the Sugar Bowl. Well, and I'll be honest, Joe, I think that Ole Miss is a better sell in a Sugar Bowl game than Alabama is because if Alabama makes the Sugar Bowl, then that means they didn't make the national championship, they didn't make the playoffs. I don't think they're going to get a lot of fan support for that game, I'll be honest. I I don't think they're going to travel very well. And meanwhile, Ole Miss fans celebrating the best year that they've had in six years uh, under a coach that's now in his second year and has ascended the program that quickly – to get them to see a game like that, I think they'll be very excited. and They'll travel well. It's going to be better for that bowl game, better for the viewership to get to see a potential Heisman Trophy winner or at least someone that makes it to New York. And I think that they're a better sell in that game than Alabama is if they can win out. Well, that's true. And Alabama's <laughs> had trouble, you know, in those Sugar Bowls when they can't win the national championship against Utah and Oklahoma, you know, to name a couple of instances. And, you know, the other thing Ole Miss is kind of playing for that's kind of cool and, and something that um, I, I did not realize is apparently they've never had a 10-win regular season. They've uh-huh. won 10 games a few times, but that was always like getting the 10th win in the bowl game. I did not know that. But, you know, that's 10 wins is harder than it sounds. Uh, weirdly, you know, on Auburn's side of it, they've never had back-to-back 10-win seasons. Isn't that strange? They've had a lot of 10-win seasons, like 10-win seasons all over the board, but never back-to-back, which is a really interesting stat. Yeah, no, that that really is. Yeah. Um, But, yeah, no, I mean, I was just so impressed with the defense and especially with the secondary, the way they played in that game. Because, as I said, I mean, uh, Zach Calzada is a limited quarterback. You can't can't say anything, you know, other than that. I think he tries really hard. He's a tough guy. He's obviously got one of the best quarterback mentors out there, Jimbo, but he's a limited quarterback. But even with that, he has some, like I said, a very good speed serve receiver under Nia Smith and a great tight end in Weidermeyer that's going to be playing on Sundays. And even so, I mean, he was completely anemic in the offense and the, the passing attack. And – you know, that was something that I was happy about that I thought was possible. But what was amazing, though, when you couple that with the fact that they didn't really get lit up by A-Chain or Spiller. And, Joe, I've noticed lately, uh, tell me if you think I'm right about this, I think A-Chain is the better running back between him and Spiller. I've noticed that in games where they play defenses that play well against them, Spiller gets shut down pretty good, but A-Chain is the one that actually makes some headway. And I noticed that in the Auburn game, too. I mean, they never really got the rushing attack going that good against Auburn, but the only one who did have some success was A-Chain in a game where they didn't score any offensive touchdowns. Yeah, we've definitely seen uh, less uh, – consistent production from Spiller, you know, you would expect more. Um, But they're still, you know, a great one-two tandem at running back. And that was kind of one of the more underrated components of this matchup for me was the Texas A&M running backs versus the Ole Miss running backs. And it was nice to me to see Ely have a good game. Right. Because I talked about his lack of consistency on the preview show on Saturday, you know, with some of the games this year where he's had like, fewer than 20 rushing yards and just kind of disappeared. So great to see him get going. 
Um, you know, Ole Miss, you know, just kind of needs to get healthy um, this weekend against Vanderbilt. But, yeah, they're definitely positioned well, and, you know, we just can't get overstated how big of a win this was for the program. And the last thing I would say, how interesting was it that Lane Kiffin was the celebrity uh, picker for uh, College Game Day? I thought that was very strange, Jeff. I'm not going to sit here and say I was a big fan of it because in my mind, like, I feel like I want him focusing on the game. I don't want him to be the celebrity picker. I mean, it worked out. I mean, Ole Miss played a great game and they won, but I just kind of feel like there were so many better options than Lane Kiffin. I'm sure, like, some Ole Miss fans were excited about it. I wasn't a big fan of it. I like Lane Kiffin a lot. I think he's a great coach, but I think he's kind of awkward on TV. Uh, he, he is, and he's not, he's not someone that I really want to watch for, like, 30 minutes as the centerpiece, you know, an entertainment thing. I mean, I'm being serious about that. So I actually was a big, uh, big, big downer on, on having Wayne Kiffin as the celebrity picker and he didn't do much for me. I just found it. I found it fascinating that they picked him. Um, like I, I looked at it like um, on some ways kind of comical that maybe it was almost like Lane Kiffin trying to say that there's no bigger celebrity that y'all can find besides me. Well, I mean, you know, it, it was – he is all about talking trash. And he – if there was ever going to be a sitting coach be a game day uh, host, it was going to be him. He was going to be the first celebrity picker to do it. But, so, I mean, it was kind of funny in that regard. But uh, there's a lot of other people I would rather see. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. You know, personally, I think this, this would be awesome. I think they should do Morgan Freeman. I think Morgan Freeman would be the best, like, celebrity picker ever. And you could do it for an Ole Miss or Mississippi State game. I don't really think it matters. Uh, you know, he didn't go to either one. But my understanding is at some point he, uh, he did work. And, and he had something to do with Ole Miss's theater department at some point. I at least heard this as a rumor a while, a while back. But, I mean, with, I think he would have been a really cool celebrity picker. And I've always wanted to see Morgan Freeman do it. Plus, just to, he's got the best voice in all of Hollywood. I just think, you know, you got a limited amount of time to get him. And that was kind of something that I was hoping it would have been. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think <laughs> that um, that would have been a good um, candidate. Eli Manning, I think, would have been good as well. It would have made sense, you know, with all the work he's doing with uh, Peyton on Monday Night Football and also with his jersey being retired. It would have been very timely. Or you know what? Here, here would have been the ultimate one, Joe. Uh, you know, we had Katy Perry before. Didn't have much of a connection at all to Ole Miss. I think her agent or something was an Ole Miss graduate. How about if you wanted to stick with that theme, Brittany finally got freed. She got out of her guardianship. Why wouldn't you have had Britney Spears be the celebrity picker? She's actually at least from Mississippi. That would have yeah. been an ultimate. That would have been a great celebrity picker right there. That would have been a good one. That, that would definitely uh, gotten some ratings. Yeah, so, I mean, I love you, Lane. I think you do a great job as Ole Miss's coach. Just not thrilled about you as a celebrity picker. <laughs> I'll tell you what I am thrilled about, though, Joe. Uh, this guy was so hot last weekend, his pants actually physically caught on fire. I don't know if you heard about this. The khakis, the Jim Harbaugh khakis, it caught on fire last weekend during the game. It was so cold up in, college, in State College, Pennsylvania, that they had those heaters rolling on the sidelines. And Jim Harbaugh was doing some coaching with one of his receivers, was standing too close to one of those heaters, and his trademark khakis caught on fire. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the team, you know, is hot right now. and You know, it definitely makes sense. It is. And you know what? I mean, he's so hot right now, he still won that game. And I got to say this, Joe, you and I both picked Penn State last weekend. This is a game that historically Harbaugh always loses. He always loses games like this. I was there earlier this year. Uh, State College is, I mean, it might be the best college football atmosphere I've ever been to. I love Auburn. I've been to all kinds of really cool Auburn games. That was the, what the experience, what I experienced at State College was the equal of any Auburn game I've ever been to or anywhere I've ever been, period. And he was able to rally his team when they were losing late in that game against a very good Nitty line defense. And Michigan scored a touchdown to win the game at the end of that. Like, it wasn't like their defense made a stop. And they did it on a passing play, Joe. What a crazy thing that is to see Michigan football throw for a touchdown to win a game against Penn State. And it was like a 40-yard wheel route to a tight end, and I, I couldn't believe it. And that was another big win for, uh, for Michigan. And suddenly now they're looking at – if they can beat, uh, if they can get that that elusive win over Ohio State at the end of the season, 
and win the Big Ten, uh, Big Ten championship game, they're going to go to the college football playoff. Yeah, I mean, they, they would certainly be a big draw, you know, as well. You know, given that opportunity, people would be fascinated to see how, how they would do in that situation. But, yeah, I mean, it was definitely unexpected for them to pull out this game. And like you said, the way they did it, getting a passing touchdown by McNamara. And then especially because when you take into consideration that the running game, you know, is just always the straw that stirs the drink. The, the running backs, like their one-two um, punch at running back, both of those guys have double-digit um, rushing touchdowns. Like, as a team, I think they're at over 2,000 yards running, rushing. And so, you know, that, that's really how they go. And so the way they won this game on Saturday was very uncharacteristic, but it was a positive thing. I think it was a very positive thing. And I, I was very impressed by that win because I just didn't see it. I didn't see a chance in that. I thought that – Penn State would be motivated. The home crowd would, would will them through. That hardball is not very good in these big road games. But that was an impressive way. It was not just an impressive win, an impressive way they won it. And I'm interested to see what happens because, you know, they're getting Ohio State in a good spot. Uh, they get Ohio State right after they have to play Michigan State. So this is kind of a, you know, tough, uh, tough back-to-back uh, sled for Ohio State right there. And speaking of Michigan State, Joe, uh, you know, we're going to talk about this. Uh, a little bit more later, but, you know, the week before, uh, Michigan was ahead of Michigan State in the college football rankings. And yet again, this week, they're still ahead of Michigan State in the college football rankings, even though we all watched that game a few weeks ago. Michigan State beat them head-to-head. And, Joe, this college football playoff committee has gone from joke to just utterly pathetic. The other night, uh, Gary Barta, who's the head of the college football playoff committee, actually said these words, and you can listen to the audio. Just forget about what you saw on the field for a second. Well, hold, hold on, hold on. Did you just say that? Forget about what you saw on the field? And he said, well, we, when you don't look at the, what happened on the field, Michigan's got better statistics than Michigan State does across the board, better statistics. What statistics? Uh, Michigan State has a statistic over Michigan that, They had more points on the board at the end of the game when they played each other three weeks ago. I don't care if you want to talk about with the refs, anything with it, uh, Michigan blowing a lead. Michigan State won that game on the field, and there's no difference in their resumes. They played the same people. I I mean, so it's not like Michigan's sitting there with seven top ten wins or something. I I mean, Joe, at this point, they're like – I don't know if you ever watched South Park, the Canadians, like characters, like their heads are not connected to their bodies – uh, the College Football Playoff Committee, that's basically the way their heads are because they talk about 360 degrees out of their mouth. And never, there's never the same thing that they're saying. I mean, they might as well just get out there and say, listen, uh, if you're not Alabama, Georgia, Michigan, Ohio State, uh, LSU, if you're not a blue blood, we will do everything possible to keep you out of the playoff. All right, great. That's the way rankings are. Just go ahead and say it. I mean, seriously, because that's absolutely ridiculous that you could have Michigan ranked ahead of Michigan State. You know, a- absolutely. It's kind of like, you know, in college basketball, we always talk about if they give a one seed to a mid-major or a non-traditional power. They They'll make Kentucky an eight seed or Duke a yeah. nine seed, you know. Right. They put a path <clears throat> for that team that's just like the region of death. And so, yeah, in college football, you see them with the playoff rankings, you know, um, everybody got excited when you don't have the computers anymore. But the disadvantage of the human element is that it allows for bias, as we see all too well. And so I think that, you know, over um, emphasizing statistics like that is just um, not a good idea because I could see it maybe if like Michigan State and Michigan were to play each other twice in the same season, where like, let's say they were in like different regions, of the Big Ten, where they could face off in the regular season and then also in the Big Ten championship game and like one won the regular season matchup, one won the championship matchup. That's a different situation. Then you, then you would look at it differently. But with that not being the case here and only one matchup, it doesn't make any sense to look at it that way. No, I mean, the only way I think that's okay for you to put a team in the playoff ahead of another one is the example of, I think this was the first year of the playoff, Ohio State getting in over Penn State. That one was fair to me. Yes, Penn State won the Big Ten championship, and yes, they beat Ohio State on the field, but they had two losses. And Ohio State had one loss. That one I can digest. I'm okay with that one. I don't really – that doesn't bother me. 
Um, let's say that same thing, Penn State. Let's say that Auburn and Penn State have vastly different seasons than what they have right now. Penn State gets that win over Auburn. Auburn, that's the only game they lose all season. They go out, they win the SEC championship, you know, having to beat Alabama, Georgia, LSU, Texas a and yada, yada, all these teams. And Penn State loses another game. Let's say they lose to Michigan, but yet they make it to the Big Ten championship game and win. That circumstance, Penn State has two losses. Auburn has one. Auburn would have beaten probably five or six top 25 teams in that scenario. I would be okay, not just as an Auburn fan, but as a neutral observer saying Auburn's the better football team. Yes, they lost to Penn State in a trip to Happy Valley, but they went undefeated in their conference. They won all their games. They have one loss. Penn State has two. That's fair to me. But that's not what you're dealing with right now with Michigan and Michigan State. You're dealing with teams that have identical resumes, except for the fact that Michigan State beat them on the field. Well, the precedent that what's contradictory about the rhetoric is is it almost makes it sound like you could have an eight and four or nine and three team in like the SEC, you know, where they got all the talent that statistically, you know, is better than some eleven and one Big Ten team, but you know they're going to go because they have better, you know, you know what I mean, like record wise. Like to me, that that that's where I'd love to have a debate with him. Yeah, um, so, well, you know, here's the thing. Let's say that Alabama, that they win this weekend against Arkansas, they beat Auburn, and they go out and they lose to Georgia, let's say, by 10 points. Um, you know, Michigan or Michigan – let's say Michigan State ends up winning the rest of their games they win the Big Ten Championship game. Uh, we're going to put Alabama in over Michigan because statistically they're a better passing offense and uh, their passing defense isn't as bad. Therefore, we're, we're thinking they're the better team. Yeah, they have two losses. They have two losses. But, but we think they're better, though. Mm-hmm. Right, right. I mean, it's just – why, why is Alabama playing football then? Mm-hmm. Why is yeah, Michigan playing just, football right now? It becomes a game of simulation and not results. Exactly. All right, Joe. Um, well, you know, speaking of, of which, uh, you know, we're talking about Ohio State giving them a lot of uh, – saying that they're in the, in the favorites of the college football playoff. I mean, they did look very impressive against the spoiler makers. They beat Purdue very badly. Purdue, of course, had two top five wins this year against Iowa and Michigan State. And uh, to give Ohio State a lot of credit, they went out there and handled Purdue very handily last weekend. They did. And Stroud you know, just continues to play well. I think you know he's still got a good chance to be in the Heisman conversation. And that offense for Ohio State, Ohio State's just getting better and better. You know, we've seen them have some really good play under Dwayne Haskins and other quarterbacks, you know, like Justin Fields, but uh, I really feel like, you know, they're on that, that, that same level. That's right. And when we get back, we're going to talk about uh, Ohio State's big game they have this weekend against Michigan State and some other big games we got going on and also give you our line of the week. And I want to have, encourage everyone to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Check out the Dan and Joe Sports Show YouTube channel. You can also uh, listen to all of our episodes on Spotify. Look at the Dan and Joe Sports Show on Spotify. And then follow us on Twitter at DJ Sports Show and like our Facebook fan page. And as always, I'm Dan. And I'm Jeff.